So it's 10.01, but we're going to uh, wait a few more minutes for a few other folks to log in here and then we'll get started. So I think we can I think we can get going here. Hopefully we have just about everybody and the rest should be joining within a few minutes. My name is Mike Nichols. I'm the president of the Wisconsin Policy Research Institute and want to thank everybody for joining us this morning. We spend about 3.4 billion dollars a year on transportation in Wisconsin and about half of that revenue right now comes from either our gas tax or our vehicle registration fees. About a fourth comes from federal sources, from federal government, federal taxpayers. About 13% uh, currently comes from bonding, which might not sound like a lot right there, but our total debt service uh, over time has really built up and is now approaching about half a billion dollars a year. We've been borrowing money for quite a few years and uh, are paying it back uh, very slowly. So our debt burden is very high. Um, there's also a problem with our gas tax. Revenue from the 31 cent uh, per gallon gas tax has been stagnant for about 10 years, actually decreasing uh, when you consider inflation. So that's uh, problematic from a revenue standpoint as well. So in recent weeks and uh, last month or so, uh, we've had renewed interest in tolling and renewed interest, I think, in, in Bob Poole, who's our, who's our guest today from the Reason Foundation. Bob is, um, is the founder and the former CEO of the Reason Foundation. He's now the uh, Director of Transportation Policy at the Reason Foundation. He has degrees, a couple degrees, I think, from uh, MIT in engineering. He's advised everyone from Federal Highway Administration to the White House, I think the White House Office of Policy Development. He's been an advisor to at least seven different states, including Wisconsin. Most recently, he's been an unpaid advisor uh, to the state of Wisconsin on an HNTB. A study that maybe he'll talk about a little bit on tolling feasibility. Uh, Bob has also done uh, some work over the years, thankfully, for WPR, WPRI. In uh, 2011, actually, he did this, this report. I'll put that in front of my face so you can see it, but that's the Wisconsin um, uh, a report he did in 2011 on feasibility of, of, uh, of tolling, um, rebuilding. Actually, I showed you the wrong report. There it is. It's uh, Rebuilding and Modernizing Wisconsin's Interstates with Toll Financing. He's also done uh, some other articles slash policy briefs and op-eds for us in, in the recent month or two on, on, on tolling. So Bob's going to give a, a 25, 20, 25 minute, I think, Bob, presentation right, right. Um, uh, today. And then uh, at the end, uh, we'll, we'll take as many questions as possible within the allotted hour or so. so Questions are going to come to me so that I can then ask them uh, of Bob and everybody can hear what the questions are. If you're watching at the top of your screen, there's a little, there's a little Q and A uh, icon. And all you have to do is, is click on there and submit your questions in writing. And if you can submit them whenever you want, although I, I think Bob is probably pretty, you know, in, intuitive here and might answer a lot of a lot of the questions that you have right now along the way. But at any rate, uh, just submit your questions to me. I'll ask as many as I can possibly get to uh, of Bob, and then Bob has offered to actually respond to the rest of the questions uh, via email. Uh, so I'm going to throw it over to Bob now. Uh, Bob, thank you very much for joining us. Bob really is uh, one of the foremost experts, if not the foremost expert on tolling in America, so we greatly appreciate you joining us. And uh, Bob's gonna talk about the why and how of tolling in Wisconsin. Thanks, Bob. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. And thank, welcome to everybody. Thanks for uh, tuning in today. 
Um, interstate tolling is on the national agenda at this point in time, uh, thanks to the White House's principles for its overall infrastructure initiative that uh, called explicitly for liberalizing the federal restrictions on what states can do in terms of, of tolling and interstates. The reason for that policy uh, is that the administration really wants to see large amounts of private capital invested in rebuilding America's infrastructure, including specifically the highway system. And uh, so uh, the, in the interstates, as we'll see, are the most important uh, highway aspect assets that we have, uh, in particular, uh, the interstate system nationwide uh, handles 25% of all the vehicle miles of travel called BMT on just two and a half percent of the lane miles. So it's very, very productive. This 40,000 plus miles are gonna need reconstruction because they were built starting in the late 1950s and most of them were finished in the 1960s. And with a 50 year design life, uh, they're getting past their sell by date and will need to be reconstructed, not just repaved or, or patched up. We also have 200 major interchange bottlenecks around the country, mostly in urban areas that cause a huge uh, obstacle traffic flow. The estimated cost of rebuilding the whole system is in the ballpark of a trillion dollars. And uh, there's no chance uh, on the horizon in anybody's scenario that Congress would provide uh, a big chunk of that kind of money uh, dedicated to the interstate reconstruction. We found at Reason Foundation, uh, as I'll explain, that uh, tolls could easy, could readily finance this in the vast majority of states, including Wisconsin. We did the study at Reason Foundation of nationwide interstate system in 2013 to estimate uh, using uh, federal numbers from Federal Highway Administration, uh, the cost of reconstructing the entire system uh, and of looking at needed additions, widenings in selected traffic projections of truck traffic and car traffic separately from uh, the Balpi Center of Federal Highway Administration and uh, use that to state by state assess uh, where do you need to add lanes that would serve for the next 50 years, uh, including potentially truck only lanes in a number of the corridors where they're, they're going to be inundated by truck traffic, uh, the projections show. And then we assess the feasibility of actually paying for this using a uh, toll revenue, new toll revenue that isn't there now, done by all electronic tolling, which is very different from old fashioned 20th century tolling with, with toll booths and, and huge staff costs. And finally, we address the political feasibility of doing such a thing because it looks, it looked at the time like it would be very daunting. The overall results of our nationwide study, we did the net present value of the cost because the cost would be spread out over 20 or 25 years. The net present value in 2010 dollars was 983 billion, so just under a trillion dollars. And the net present value of revenue using the toll assumptions that we made was, was very close to that, which was surprisingly positive results. 30 states could do it with the basic toll rates that we assumed. Nine of those could actually do it with lower rates. Nine states needed slightly higher rates, and six urban states, California and New York among them, would need even higher rates than our baseline rates. Only six states that were rural and mountainous were not really toll feasible. There'd probably have to be some kind of federal help for them to, to do this. But those that's a very different picture than what we saw in 1956 when the Interstate Highway Program was approved by Congress to be funded by federal new federal gasoline taxes. Uh, they, a number of people had wanted to do tolling of that whole system, but it really looked like it was only be feasible in the Northeast and parts of the Midwest. The South and the West looked hopeless at that point, between massive population and industry shifts since the 1950s. Now, Wisconsin specifically, uh, as uh, George, uh, as uh, Mike mentioned, uh, we did a study for WPRI in 2011 that with great cooperation and all data inputs from Wisconsin DOT, and we estimated in 2016, $2010 dollars, the cost would be $20, $26 billion spread over a number of years to reconstruct and widen where necessary the whole system. Uh, last year, the HNTB study that was uh, funded by the Wisconsin legislature, uh, very, very fortunately, uh, estimated the potential toll revenue uh, uh, would be $29 billion. So when you adjust our number of cost numbers for inflation, there looks like a pretty good match between uh, their estimate of toll revenue, our estimate of costs, uh, and 
the good thing for uh, the state's transportation budget is if you were able to switch to toll financing to do the whole interstate modernization project, that would free up your existing federal uh, uh, highway funds and all your state fuel tax money for all the rest of the state's transportation needs. So there would be a, a, a bonus in effect in that way. Now, what's stopping this? Why aren't people just jumping at the chance to do it? Well, one reason is that federal law that was enacted when they created the interstate program was that any uh, highway that was part of the interstate system that had to be newly built with the federal gas money uh, could not be told. It had to be sort of quote unquote free. Uh, existing, the law today has opened, loosened that somewhat for non-interstate highways. And even for interstates, you could add toll lanes to, to the interstates, but federal law bans tolling the existing lanes. And by that, they mean uh, lanes in the original right-of-way. But our view is that a, a reconstructed lane is a replacement, just as if you're replacing an obsolete bridge. So it's not the existing lanes, but that isn't the way the federal government and Congress currently interpret the law that they wrote. In addition, there's been strong opposition to any expansion of tolling from the trucking industry and concerns from the other highway user groups, such as AAA. And Congress has generally been leery of getting into a big battle with highway users. So that, that's why we haven't seen much progress on this recently. So the main point of, of this discussion today is how do we make toll finance reconstruction politically feasible in Wisconsin and in other states? And we thought, have thought about a lot about that at Reason Foundation. Uh, we need to really listen to what highway users say they're concerned about, figure out can we develop more user-friendly tolling policies to accomplish this huge trillion dollar task. And we came up with some policies that I'll explain this morning Called, which we call value-added tolling. Now, when we listen to all the concerns, two of the concerns the trucking industry still raises are obsolete because of all electronic toll collection. Number one is that uh, with the conventional toll booths, you often get long lines, delays, emissions because the cars are idling and putting out more, more bad stuff, and accidents, people rear-ending others uh, in, in the toll plant. Well, we aren't going to have toll. If Wisconsin were to do this, there would not be any toll plazas, any toll booths, or any cash tolling on the road. Uh, second is the high cost of toll collection. The trucking industry still refers to 20th century toll collection that costs between 20 and 25 percent of all the toll revenue just to pay for the overhead costs of all the staff and all the physical facilities needed. All AET means all electronic tolling. Doing that with a streamlined business model that emphasizes the transponder that goes on your windshield uh, can, can get the cost of toll collection down to 5% of the revenue, which is a huge difference from 20 or 25%. It makes this far more feasible to do. So those concerns are really obsolete in today's discussion looking forward. But there are four remaining concerns that the highway users have a legitimate reason to be concerned about. Number one, no value added, just slapping tolls on the existing unimproved highways. Number two, diverting revenue from tolls to other uses, so the toll kinds of looks more like a tax than an than a actual user. Double taxation, paying the tolls and fuel taxes on the same highway if the tolls are supposedly paying for it altogether, and traffic diversion to parallel routes. So let's take a quick look at those things and see what we can see about them. When Congress first started the interstate uh, uh, tolling pilot program that allows three states to, uh, uh, re to use tolls to finance, some of the applications uh, were the wor trucker's worst nightmare because uh, several states proposed the tolling as a general funding source for their transportation. Uh, and those applications were rejected because that's not what the program said. Virginia proposed border tolls, which wouldn't pay for reconstructing their I-95, which is what they wanted to do. Only Missouri and North Carolina took the, ser the, pr the program seriously, but they never got political consensus, and now they have timed out. They've lost their slot. Uh, but if we actually have a program that replaces the obsolete pavement and interchanges, that would add real value, and that's what the pilot program was intended to do. Diversion of toll revenues is something uh, that happens not universally, but about a dozen large toll agencies, mostly in the, almost exclusively in the Northeast, except for San Francisco, divert toll revenue to other highways, to mass transit, to so-called economic development in New York State, to the canal system, and the public buildings such as the World Trade Center in New York. 
And uh, Moody's Investment Service, which does bond ratings, calls this the cash cowification of toll roads. And the rating agencies actually give lower investment grade ratings to the toll agencies that do divert revenue because they are less secure. They don't have as big reserve funds and so forth. So that is, that is definitely a real phenomenon that needs to be avoided in going forward. Double taxation means paying tolls and fuel tax on the same interstate. Uh, and what we see uh, on non-tolled interstates, the average that motorists pay through federal and state gas taxes is 2.2 cents a mile. But on the interstates that are like, like I-80 in Illinois, I mean, in, in, uh, in uh, Indiana and Ohio, uh, the average person pays this is talking about car tolls, six and a half cents a mile between the combination of the fuel taxes and the tolling. So that, that cost disparity is something that highway users really don't think they're getting a good deal for, and I, and I have to sympathize with that. Traffic diversion is a real phenomenon. Anybody who does a traffic and revenue study in planning a, a new toll road has to calculate what, how much traffic would this, this road attract if it were non-tolled, and they apply a diversion factor of how much traffic would not use it because of the toll. And this does cause pavement impacts on parallel routes. It does add uh, bad things to the parallel routes. But an important factor is the lower the toll rates, the less traffic diversion there will be. And the high toll rates in states that divert a lot of toll revenue actually encourage more traffic diversion to parallel routes. So one of the lessons here is you keep the toll rates as low as possible. And we'll get back to that in a moment. So value added tolling print, the four things we came up with that would uh, respond to user concerns. Number one, limit the use of the toll revenues just to the toll facility, pure user fee. You're not uh, trying to do fund anything else out of this and charge only enough to cover the full capital and operating costs of the facility that is that has the new toll. This would be if it were a new new toll bridge across the Mississippi, say, uh, or if it's a new a replacement for I-94 or some of the other interstates in, in Wisconsin. Third, begin the tolling only after the construction is finished, just as if it were a new bridge. It adds insult to injury to have a, a interstate torn up for three or four years while it's being reconstructed and charge people tolls for having to sit through that you charge when, only when they're getting new value, uh, not, not when uh, you're under construction. And then use tolls to replace, not to supplement existing fuel taxes. So that if you rebuild I-94 or some other Wisconsin interstate, uh, the idea would be that people would pay the tolls, but they would not pay the state uh, gas tax. Now, a very important point that hardly anybody realizes is that AAA, the largest highway user group in America, supports these value-added tolling principles. I spoke, I have, at, by invitation, I spoke at the AAA board meeting, actually the slide is in it was September 2015, and gave a presentation on value-added tolling and the need to reconstruct and modernize the interstates. Their board voted to support this and has urged the state AAA clubs, because they're a, they're a federation of, of state and regional clubs, to support this when the subject of uh, interstate reconstruction with tolls comes up in states. So one could hope that you would go, if there's a decision in Wisconsin to do this, go to the AAA chapter and uh, try to enlist their support in explaining this to their members and to the public at large. So what are Wisconsin's options today when it comes to looking at doing this? Uh, number one option is there's this three state pilot program that I mentioned that currently has all three slots empty. So there's an opportunity to apply to that. Uh, states where this is seriously being discussed in addition to Wisconsin are Colorado, Connecticut, Indiana, Oregon, and Rhode Island. Indiana voted this spring, their legislature, to authorize their governor to actually apply to one or both of the two programs that would permit interstate tolling. And as far as I know, they're the only one that's actually done that legislatively so far. It's important to recognize this pilot program allows only one corridor in each of the states that's in it to be rebuilt with toll finance bits in the nature of it being called a pilot program. The other option, which you could do apply to one or both, would be to apply to something called the Federal Highway Administration's Value Pricing Program. This applies only to congested facilities, particularly uh, would apply to urban interstates in the Milwaukee uh, metro area. 
It allows tolling all lanes for the purpose of managing traffic congestion. But of course, that would generate a lot of revenue. In fact, the toll rates, if you design them to be variable to, to manage the congestion, would probably generate more revenue than the average corridor on an urban, I mean, on a rural interstate. So it would be an, could be an important funding source, even though the program isn't designed to do that. And there are three or four slots open in that. It's a 15-state uh, uh, pricing program that's been existed for about 15 years. And so that's also an option. Uh, you could do one or both of, of those. Now, the key question is, would the public accept tolling? And uh, I was on a, uh, a panel of the Transportation Research Board about uh, 10 years ago that looked at 10 years of survey data about highway finance. And it turns out if, you, if a survey asks voters, uh, here's the situation, we have a big transportation need that our current funding sources cannot do. And so we need some new funding source to do them. Here are four or five alternatives and you tell us which you prefer or which is least bad. And typically those surveys would ask one option would be tolling the new or replacement facility. The others would all be some kind of additional tax. And in survey after survey, the large majority showed that tolling turned out to be the least bad alternative. And there's an understandable reason why this is. If you, if the public, if the voters uh, in the survey say, all right, we're going to accept an increase, let's say the gas tax, a sales tax or some other tax to pay for this. The only thing they being being cynical uh, are certain of is they're going to pay more tax. They're not certain that anything is going to be built using that money that can make their life easier and better. With tolls, by contrast, you would only pay a toll for something if it, if that builds a project that you can and will use because the toll is reasonable. It actually provides value for you. So there's a big difference in that and this, it should give us encouragement that uh, the public can understand this and would see the toll alternative as at the very least, least bad as opposed to preferred. And then other question, key question, could Wisconsin DOT accept fuel tax rebates that would go along with a reconstructed facility paid for solely by tolls? Well, first of all, rebates are not a brand new idea. Uh, there are truck fuel tax rebates on the New York Thruway and the Massachusetts Turnpike. Those, unfortunately, don't have, or they haven't until recently had electronic tolling. So they were originated in the cash tolling era. They required a lot of paperwork. You had to save receipts from when you paid cash tolls and so forth. Today, with all electronic tolling, this is much easier. They can be built into the tolling software. Uh, with, with all electronic tolling, the system knows who the customer is. They know the vehicle type. You can look up the EPA miles per gallon rating, and you know the number of miles driven uh, on the toll facility. So that's all you need to automatically calculate uh, the amount of gas used and the toll and the tax rate and calculate the, uh, the amount of the rebate. The state DOT could provide a file to uh, some agency, the state treasury or the Department of Motor Vehicles, whoever, with a file on who needs, who's owed what rebate for this month or this quarter and then that would be up to another agency to disperse the rebates. Now, the state would still come out ahead on this compared to using uh, fuel tax money because the per mile yield of tolls to rebuild an interstate is higher than the per mile yield of, fuel, of current fuel taxes. And that's because interstates are a lot more expensive to build and pay for. Uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons why we haven't started rebuilding them because the fuel tax revenue simply doesn't, doesn't yield enough to do that. Now, because of, of the Trump administration's uh, uh, infrastructure reconstruction principles, uh, longer term reform could be part of that in Congress this year or whenever they get around to actually legislating on, on the infrastructure program. And what those who believe that this is a good uh, idea, uh, toll finance interstate reconstruction should do, is work to completely liberalize, expand that reconstruction pilot program to all 50 states, not limited to uh, a handful of states. And each state that gets permission to do this uh, would be able to uh, toll finance and reconstruct over a period of say 20 years, all the states interstates to renew the whole system, get it set for the 21st century and the traffic that it's going to encounter. And uh, 
this federal permission then should at least encourage, if not mandate, use of, uh, well, it should encourage use of P3 concessions, the private capital investment that the administration wants to encourage, uh, which would avoid the state having to issue new bonds uh, because the private sector would do the financing. And it should require the value-added tolling principles to make it easier for the legislature to say, all right, well, you know, this is what Congress says, in order to get permission to do the program, we have to adopt these user-friendly principles. And so this would be something that uh, uh, those interested in seeing Wisconsin and those in other states do, uh, having the flexibility to do the entire program of renewal of the interstates could lobby for and should make their voices known uh, as this starts getting debated in Congress after they've done uh, tax reform and, and uh, Obamacare reform. So, and the incentive for a state, including Wisconsin, to do this, the assumption going forward should be that if Congress would allow this larger tolling flexibility, guarantees that a state that opts into the program would, would get the same amount, its current amount of federal highway aid, and if the state DOT over time converts all its interstate to toll financing, then the federal and state transportation money no longer has to be spent on the interstates and can be devoted to a more robust program of taking care of all the other uh, state transportation needs in the state. So that's basically the message uh, for reference and the PowerPoint is available uh, through WPRI. Three key reports that are on the Reason Foundation website that uh, you might want to read to get more details on the three studies on which this presentation is based. And with that, uh, uh, Mike, we're ready. Uh, I'm ready to uh, take questions that have, uh, have submitted. Thanks very much. Great, that was fantastic, Bob. You were very prescient because you did address many of the, of the questions that have come in already. But uh, let me uh, uh, combine a couple of questions here that people have asked, and uh, some of this will be uh, a sort of a reiteration, but uh, looking for some further detail on a couple of things. Sure. Um, we have uh, several people who are really interested in the impact of trucks versus, uh, versus cars um, and smaller vehicles. Um, so a few questions along those lines. Um, Cases made that heavy trucks create exponentially more damage to roads than cars. Do you agree? Right. Do you believe that trucks should be told at a higher rate because of the damage they create to the roadbed? And there's also a related question, which you have addressed a little bit about diversion of heavy traffic, particularly right. truck traffic, off of uh, off of interstates onto, uh, okay. onto smaller onto smaller roads. So I wonder if you could address those questions. Sure. Let, let's see if we can address all of those. Uh, the yeah. universal practice of toll roads in the United States is to charge uh, uh, between two and four times higher or some, two, between two and five times higher for trucks because of the higher, much higher damage they do. Uh, it goes up at the third power of the axle weight loading uh, of trucks. And so it really does pr produce significantly more wear and tear. So uh, the study that I mentioned, the Reason Foundation study that estimated the approximate $1 trillion net present value of, of the cost and then estimated revenue used different toll rates for cars. We actually used four times greater rates for heavy trucks, uh, the 18 wheelers and so forth, than for passenger cars. And uh, so that's very consistent with standard practice and with, with engineering analysis that understands this. Uh, I don't have detailed data on, on the percentage of, of toll revenue that comes typically from trucks versus cars. I believe on the Indiana toll road, uh, which is which is one uh, interstate, uh, uh, I think 80 and 90 across Indiana. I think I have read that about half of the toll revenue there comes from trucks. Uh, so if, if that's typical, then that would be the kind of ballpark we're, we're likely talking about here. So trucks are very important, but it also depends on how heavy uh, uh, a truck use there is of the interstates in Wisconsin compared to Illinois or Indiana or so forth. A lot of the trucking, main trucking flows are east-west uh, across the Midwest. Uh, so it may not, it's probably not as high in Wisconsin as it is in, say, uh, Indiana. Yeah. On the diversion, uh, one, just one other thought on the diversion question. Um, if To the extent that uh, trucks would potentially divert in Wisconsin to roads, uh, parallel roads that are not really designed and paved to handle the weight of, of trucks, it's perfectly possible for, for those to be posted with weight limits uh, and, uh, and also to not be 
improved with uh, uh, with overpasses and things to be more like interstates. Um, they're typically those parallel routes have a lot of traffic lights, and so there's a real trade-off in terms of timeliness for a truck that would divert. Um, so it's and and if the trucks are getting a rebate on their on at least on their state uh, diesel taxes, that would make the cost wouldn't be as high as they're now paying on tolled interstates in uh, in Illinois and Wisconsin and Ohio. So it would be less of a burden to them than in states where they're already paying uh, tolls in addition to fuel taxes. Here's a tough question. Uh, they're not asking for a breakdown on revenue from trucks versus cars, but actually on, on actual use, including use, uh, uh, and I don't know if you'd have this on Wisconsin uh, versus anywhere else, but uh, out-of-state drivers versus, uh, versus uh, in-state drivers typically uh, in, a, in, a, in an area, I guess, rel relatively, relatively close to a state border. Have you ever seen any numbers on that? The actual question is, on a typical day, what's the breakdown or profile of interstate drivers in Wisconsin? And then trucks you've addressed versus daily commuters, out-of-state drivers and, and uh, right. I, interstate drivers. Yeah, I don't, I don't have an overall figure. Uh, it's probably fairly high on the routes that come across the border from Illinois. Uh, as a percentage, but statewide, it's 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 significantly lower than that. Uh, I think in the study that I did for WPRI in 2011, there was a figure from Wisconsin DOT somewhere in that report, but I don't remember what the what the figure is, and it's a little bit outdated uh, as as it is. Um, the question of of border tolling is was was possibly implied in that uh, that question, and let me address that for a moment. Uh, I know Governor Walker mentioned that uh, uh, within the last uh, month or so as a possibility. Um, border tolling uh, raises a serious constitutional question. No one has ever implemented it in the United States. It's been talked about a lot. It's been talked about recently in Connecticut and in a few other states that are looking at interstate tolling. The problem is the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. The reason that Commerce Clause is in there is that under the before we had the Constitution, under the Articles of Confederation, states actually charged tariffs at their state borders as if they were countries. And this was a significant impediment to the free flow of interstate commerce. And so uh, uh, there's a good legal thinking, although it's never been litigated, the Supreme Court has never addressed it, that if a state put up tolls only at the state border, it would be uh, interfering with the flow of interstate commerce as opposed to charging everybody who used its highways the same rates uh, whether which ones and how long, how far they drove, say on all of the interstates uh, in in Wisconsin. So I would I would strongly argue against even thinking about border tolling or border tolling only. Uh, certainly, now there's you obviously you should be uh, if you're doing interstate reconstruction, you should be charging for every mile that's reconstructed. So uh, if you reconstruct say I-94 from the border northward, um, you would start charging as soon as people cross the state line. Would you be charging no matter where they got on, and you stop charging whenever they got off? So it would be per mile tolling, uh, ideally. Here's one, Bob, just about the uh, logistics. Really, we all know it's the modern era, and this wouldn't be slowing down uh, to a booth and throwing change right. in a basket. It's not that anymore. However, um, it's a question about the Easy Pass system that's used right. uh, elsewhere and um, how that would work, and whether or not uh, you know. Whether or not there be use of what they do in Illinois, I think to some extent, which is uh, you know uh, catching license plates as people go through and then billing them that way. Can you just talk a little bit more about the logistics of how actually you know we get we get charged for this if we don't have sure, our our, sure. our our I pass, I guess. Right. The state of the art uh, today, uh, all electronic tolling is the main emphasis is transponder tolling, like the Easy Pass transponder that goes on the windshield which would make sense for, for uh, uh, Wisconsin to join because said there are 15 states now in the Northeast and Midwest that are all on the same uh, system. So you could go any, on any of the toll facilities in all 15 states, you have one account and one transponder and you get one bill. Uh, so this is very, very handy. Um, but all transponder systems have a backup of license plate uh, imaging because uh, some people will try to sneak through uh, without a transponder and thinking they can get away with it and not pay. And if the system has been financed based on toll revenue, you can't, or you can't have uh, a significant fraction of people uh, stealing service basically 
by not having a transponder and, and so forth. So the license plate uh, imaging and the sophisticated video systems are, are quite good these days, uh, is the backup. Uh, and in many of the systems, they uh, actually advertise that, like Florida Turnpike, which is converting to all electronic tolling, they advertise if you don't have a, what we call a SunPass in Florida, uh, don't worry, we'll image your license plate and bill you that way. Uh, now, billing through a license plate costs four or five times as much as, uh, as having a prepaid account uh, like exists in, in the EasyPass states. Uh, that's really low cost. That's where you get down to 5% of the, of the cost of, of, of revenue, 5% of the revenue needed for collection. So what most states do, and this is at the state's option, is they charge a surcharge uh, for anybody that uses uh, license plate billing that covers at least part of the additional cost of doing that. My view, they should charge a surcharge that covers all the costs because that would provide a much more, a much stronger incentive for everybody to get a transponder and, and get the cost of collection way, way down. But that's probably not a practical reality. There's probably, you probably need to always have that for people who hardly ever use a toll facility uh, and don't want to have, go to the bother of setting up an account. Yeah, here's a question about whether tolls are regressive or not, Bob, whether they hurt the poor more than folks of higher incomes. And I think I think the context of this partly is, again, in the state of Wisconsin, we have right now a 31 uh, percent per gallon gas tax. So that's the way things currently are. So maybe right. you could talk about that and the issue of regressivity versus tolls. That would be helpful. OK, there's there's not much difference between uh, the regressivity of tolls and fuel taxes. Uh, for the simple reason that uh, um, the amount of, of traveling people do in motor vehicles goes up significantly with income. Um, so uh, uh, people uh, pay, so that's on the one hand, uh, people pay a lot more uh, if they uh, are in a high income bracket than if they're in a low income bracket. On the other hand, the regressivity comes in in that the percentage of a person's annual income spent on the transportation uh, tends to be higher for people in higher in uh, percentage uh, for low income people than for higher income people. Uh, but there's not a fundamental difference between uh, uh, tolling and, and fuel taxes on that question of regressivity, uh, especially if the tolling is a, becomes a pure user fee and people aren't having to pay a gas tax on top of it. So uh, it's a reality of life that uh, uh, Food is also, uh, the cost of food is a higher percentage of, of a low income family's uh, 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 annual income than a high income family's in income. But that, that's just a reality that, that uh, is there and, and it's probably not going to change. Here's a very specific uh, question about, uh, uh, and it's really about the HNTB study, um, uh, Bob, but it has to do with uh, what's the, uh, the, um, Actually, and the WPRI study uh, that you right. did. What's what's the projection of the twenty nine billion in potential revenue uh, based on? Um, and it was that, if if you recall exactly. Um, uh, well, in, in in WPRI study, uh, we did a similar projection to the one that we did on a national scale two years later uh, of of a separate rate for cars and for trucks. And I don't, don't, we may have used three times higher for trucks in the WPRI study and four times higher uh, for trucks in the Reason study for nationwide, but there was a similar, method, very similar methodology, even though the specific numbers may have been different. And uh, uh, and and an important point that I didn't mention in in the presentation, uh, Mike, is that we assume those tolls in both studies were inflation adjusted by the consumer price index, so that they would not lose their real purchasing power value over time. And this is very important. Uh, uh, my view, as we are starting to think about replacing fuel taxes, uh, we, there's a national conversation going on that we need to eventually, because of electric cars and, and other hybrid cars and so forth, uh, the, most people assume over the next 25 years or so, there's gonna be a lot fewer uh, cars and trucks uh, uh, fueled by petroleum products. And uh, this is going to, it's very likely it's going to devastate our current highway funding system, which is based on per gallon fuel taxes. So charging per mile is what a lot of states have started pilot programs to, uh, to look into. 
And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. And one of them is to charge per mile tolls on limited access facilities like the interstates. And uh, so that is, is uh, another one of the reasons why uh, uh, there's support among a lot of transportation uh, policy researchers and some DOTs for the idea of we need to start, start the transition uh, from per gallon to per mile and that uh, introduce, introducing more use of tolling is a, is a way to do that because tolling is familiar to people. They know what it is. Whereas some other kind of mileage based fee on ordinary roads is be very unfamiliar and, and more difficult for people to get their arms around. Yeah, there is a question here about how much we'd have to hike up the gas tax in order to cover uh, the expected costs of, uh, of uh, maintaining and reconstructing our, our highways. And uh, I, don't, I don't know that we have the answer to that one, but what you're saying is that uh, you know, lot of short term, maybe we could keep hiking up the gas tax, but long term, five, 10, 20 years down the road, people are less dependent on, on gas and petroleum products and more, you know, you have batteries and, you know, right, right. Uh, that uh, people are perhaps even driving less given technological change that it's yeah, not, a, you, a growing, your, it's not, not a, not a long-term solution. No, it's not a growing number of state DOTs. I don't know if, if Wisconsin uh, DOT has done this, but have done uh, projections uh, of the next uh, 20 or 30 years of, uh, of, of fuel tax revenue. And I've seen a few of those and they're pretty depressing. Um, uh, we seem to be at the point now of having uh, maxed out the yield of existing. Uh, the, only, the only reason, the only places we're getting more gas tax revenue is where there've been significant increases uh, adopted by legislatures in the last few years. Where the gas tax rates and diesel tax have been flat, uh, we're already starting to see downward uh, uh, trend in, in the yield of uh, you know actual annual dollars produced, and the projections looking ahead ten or twenty years are pretty scary uh, uh, when when they've been done carefully and competently. Obviously, they depend on assumptions of how fast there's a transition to workable, affordable electric vehicles and other potentially fuel cell vehicles and so forth. Uh, but that transition, in some fashion or another, is underway and uh, uh, is like very likely to continue, uh, according to basically every serious transportation researcher in the country and overseas as well. Here's a question. What is the upfront cost of construction of IT infrastructure to make these systems work on a statewide basis? And how much does this add to total project costs for reconstruction? I guess it's a question about actual, you know, construction costs of rebuilding a road versus, versus the uh, right, IT, and right. IT and technology costs. We, we in, in both uh, the, the WPRI study and our national interstate uh, study, we uh, got several experts in electronic tolling to come up with generic cost figures. Uh, and uh, uh, I think, as I recall, it was something like 5% of the total capital cost of the, uh, of the reconstruction and widening uh, was accounted for by the infrastructure that uh, was needed. Uh, these would be gantries to, uh, 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 and we assumed at each on-ramp and off-ramp and not anywhere else. Gantries and communications line, uh, uh, you typically you need a lot of fiber optic uh, lines to get the data from those tolling gantries to the places where computers would uh, be operating the tolling algorithms. There's definitely staff needed uh, to uh, manage the system and to uh, 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 do the billing where you're going to have billing of people who don't have the prepaid transponder accounts. But the total labor cost is dramatically lower than with 21st century cash tolling. Uh, and the infrastructure cost is lower as well because you're not, you're not acquiring the land to build toll plazas. You're not building and maintaining these the large physical facilities. Uh, the actual staff can be located in any kind of office building uh, or in a DOT headquarters building as long as they have access to the fiber optic lines that are bringing in uh, all, the, all the data from the, from the on-road system. So not a huge uh, factor, and nowhere near as much as it would have been if we were still stuck with 20th century tolling technology. So what does Wisconsin have to do next, Bob, in terms of uh, keeping open the possibility <coughs> of tolling? Right, well, my recommendation is that uh, before this legislative session ends, um, the legislature should do what Indiana's legislature has already done and authorize the governor uh, to uh, apply 
on behalf of Wisconsin DOT to one or both of the two existing federal pilot programs. That's the immediate uh, action. Uh, certainly, uh, 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 then getting the word out to explain to people uh, uh, what this would be if, if, uh, if Wisconsin gets a slot in one or the other of the programs. Uh, and uh, I know, I know uh, the governor and, and the Wisconsin DOT per se don't lobby, but certainly uh, the transportation community uh, should support uh, this initiative and should be watching and following the debate in Congress on the administration's infrastructure program, which is a tremendous opportunity to expand that existing three-state pilot program in the way that I suggested to all 50 states, give every state a shot at, uh, at using this mechanism uh, and attracting private capital investment that could go with it, um, which, which would uh, be, we hope, a part of whatever Congress does with uh, what the Trump administration has proposed for the large infrastructure program. Is it, is it typical for states to apply to both versus one or the other? One, one being a corridor, uh, one single corridor right. um, uh, versus, versus the other program? Well, they are completely separate programs. There's no, uh, I've, I have not, I've not been aware of a state at the same time applying to the two of them, but Virginia uh, was an early uh, partner uh, in the value pricing uh, uh, program. And they also applied and got a slot in the uh, uh, interstate reconstruction, toll finance reconstruction pilot. So there's no, no bar, bar whatsoever to uh, applying to both. And it's separate, separate offices that, that handle them. So uh, uh, I, would, I would encourage to keep the options open to apply to both, but if there's, a good, if there's some reason based on discussion that one seems like a better near-term fit, uh, then at least applying to one. The important point is not let this legislation, this legislative session end without taking some action to preserve because uh, you know, there's five or six other states uh, in, that may apply sometime this year uh, depending on their legislative schedules and so forth, and you don't want to be further than out if, while there's still only three slots. Yeah, George, George Mitchell, who had asked uh, asked some great questions, including the one about whether or not we'd be limited to using tolling on one corridor or not, which he sort of just answered. Um, right. Also asked, why does Illinois still use toll booths? Why? <laughs> <laughs> why? I, you know what? Well, I have to tell you, Bob. I went from. <laughs> About two weeks ago, I went down to Indiana. My father-in-law had a 90th birthday party. It took us seven hours to get from oh. Cedarburg, where I am, north of, north of Milwaukee, down to a little town north of, uh, you know, north of Indianapolis. And, uh, I, you know, why do they still use toll booths? We do, we do have an iPass that we use most of the time, but it was just right, terrible getting right. through there. Well, I mean, there's a certain amount of inertia in, in toll agencies uh, uh, that, I mean, they all know uh, that... They, they should convert and they are planning to convert to all electronic tolling. Usually they take a first step as uh, uh, putting cash tolling over to the side and uh, allowing anyone with a transponder to uh, not have to slow down and just go drive at highway speed under the tolling gantry and, and take the toll that way. That's called open road tolling. I believe uh, uh, Illinois has done a lot of that. Florida uh, started that about six years ago on the Florida Turnpike, and they're now gradually replacing the open road tolling with all electronic tolling. And uh, uh, a number of other agencies, uh, mostly the urban ones, uh, such as the E-470 in Denver and the North Texas Tollway Association in Dallas-Fort Worth, have gone to completely all electronic tolling. There's no more cash tolling on those systems at all. Uh, Orange County, California has done the same thing. So it's, this is an ongoing trend. But uh, a lot of these agencies don't move really quickly. They, they know what they need to do and they have to plan. It, it does cost. They have to you know, budget and get approval and so forth. So, but it's, it is happening definitely across the country. I have, uh, I think, uh, combined or synopsized uh, all of the questions that I've had. Uh, if anybody has some others that I've overlooked or that they want to ask, uh, it's 1050 and we promised to wrap this up uh, within 60 minutes. So we have time for a couple of other uh, quick ones. Anything else you want to add, Bob? And we'll give people a chance to uh, ask a couple other questions here. Uh, well, I, I, I can't overemphasize the fact that uh, uh, transportation groups like the Wisconsin Transportation Builders Association 
Uh, I'm sure are paying attention to the White House infrastructure uh, ideas and will be paying attention for sure when Congress actually starts debating uh, the infrastructure program. Uh, I really commend to those groups in particular to uh, and their counterparts in other states to uh, uh, push hard for uh, broadening the, uh, the toll uh, reconstruction pilot program uh, and really open it up to all 50 states. Uh, uh, what we really need to get this to be seen as, as a credible alternative is for one what I call pathfinder state to uh, uh, adopt, to get into it, adopt the value, uh, uh, value added tolling principles, get it politically accepted as, as uh, feasible and as the best option that they have and show that this will work. Um, that will then cause other states, I think, legislators, legislatures and governors to say, oh, okay, well, state X, they actually got it through the legislature and they're going forward with it, but here's a, he, he, was, he was the secret sauce that did it, that made it attractive to the highway user groups that got AAA to come in favor of it, that uh, uh, answered the trucking industry's concern, even though they might not have gotten on board fully. Um, one state that does that uh, will be the pathfinder for the nation and, and show the way forward. And I think that is something that is, would be more likely to happen if we expand that program and allow all states to, uh, to apply instead of just having it very narrowly limited. I only have one other question that just came in, okay. uh, and really it has to do with Wisconsin, Wisconsin's constitution um, more uh, than some of the issues you've discussed. But the question okay. is, uh, given the Wisconsin transportation fund is constitutionally protected, in other words, there was a constitutional amendment here that, uh, that resulted in us uh, having to constitutionally use the transportation fund money for transportation instead of robbing the transportation fund and using it for general funds. It's another question, I guess, about the concern that, hey, we'll toll and the money will end up being used for other purposes. Uh, the question is what, is, the, what is the political difference between tolls and gas or registration increases uh, that could generate revenue without the additional infrastructure. Right. Well, <clears throat> my my strong recommendation would be that uh, uh, the any any tolling that would be enacted in Wisconsin for the specific purpose of of modern rebuilding, modernizing the state's interstate highways, should be legally and maybe even constitutionally dedicated to that sole purpose. So it is a true user fee. In that way, uh, it, it, it clears the way for uh, no longer needing to use uh, uh, federal and state fuel tax money for the interstates and allowing that money to be available with its constitutional safeguards, which I strongly approve of, for all the rest of, of the system across the state. Uh, so uh, clearly the principle involved in that uh, constitutional protection of, of the uh, existing highway funding sources is a sound one of, of these are supposed to be user taxes. Make sure you keep them user taxes and don't steal the money uh, for other non-transportation purposes. Likewise, the toll revenue needs to be safeguarded at least by statute as being solely for the purpose of, of the modernization and ongoing maintenance and eventual and expanding where needed of the interstates uh, in, in Wisconsin. Uh, Thanks, Bob. Um, equally valid there. Uh, one other question about Illinois. We have we just have a couple of minutes left here, but I'll okay. ask all the I'll ask all the questions I can that are coming in. Uh, there's a perception that Illinois' tolling system has been a failure, and uh, we love to point out failures in Illinois. Um, is there <laughs> is that is that a, is that a common perception? Can you speak to that? Have has it has it been? A I have I have never heard that claim, and I I voraciously read uh, uh, what's going on in transportation in all 50 states to the extent that's possible. I've never heard that allegation. I, I'm surprised. I mean, I see what, what the Illinois Tollway is doing is responsibly continuing to expand and grow their system uh, to uh, uh, deal with the needs of, of uh, the growing uh, Chicago metro area in particular. And uh, I mean, I, I contrast that which, with the, the angst I see in the states that don't have tolling. Uh, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? There's not enough money. It's impossible to raise the gas tax, blah, blah, blah. And it's a breath of fresh air to see what the Illinois, uh, Illinois Tollway is doing uh, uh, in, in continuing to expand and, and, and reconstruct uh, their system uh, in, a, in what looks to me from a distance in a very responsible fashion. 
Bob, thank you so much for your time. That's all the questions that we have uh, at WPRI. We appreciate it. You know, we're a free market think tank and we believe that tolling could be a good free market solution to our needs uh, in transportation, especially given concerns over um, the amount of bonding that we've been doing over the years and uh, problems ongoing, as you've discussed with, not just in Wisconsin, but elsewhere with uh, per gallon uh, fuel taxes. So. Uh, we just think this is uh, really one of those um, foremost incredibly important policy issues that uh, you know we can see with what's going on in, in Madison that uh, we really might need to find a way forward not just in this budget but but long term and um, Bob you're the you're the guy with more answers than anyone so we appreciate you sharing those with us today thanks very much Mike